Hello, my name is Herbert Falk, and we're going to spend 15 or 20 minutes discussing security for IEC 61850. A lot of people in the industry have the misperception that IEC 61850 protocols and infrastructure is not secure. That is a fake fact. In reality, 61850 has had security standards since 2007, and security for the client server profile, which is similar to ICCP since 2001. Layer 2 Goose and Sample Value Security was developed in 2007. As was with many security frameworks, continuous improvements have been made over the years, and many implementations already have some of the security profiles already implemented, but utilities have not requested vendors to supply it and have not deployed it. The NERC high-level requirements are to educate uh, the utility employees in their processes, technologies, and security paradigms that are going to be deployed, to deploy technology to mitigate cyber threats, to monitor and detect those threats, to react and respond to a threat, even if it hasn't uh, been successful, and to document your processes. So how can 61850 security help meet NERC SIP requirements? This table is very busy, but you can see there are many standards related to system monitoring. There are standards uh, that assist in providing role-based access control, system monitoring, and data in transit uh, protection that, for information that goes across an electronic security perimeter. As with most IEDs, they have the ability to monitor I.O. and therefore can provide some help in monitoring physical asset access to the substations or the IED. There is substantial work going on in, uh, for patch management, so you can do remote patching, including security patches, to 61850 IEDs. To assist in system reporting, incident reporting and responses, there's the system monitoring capability up here, combined with the patch management capability of 90-16. Recovery is part of the documented process that utilities have to provide. And again, the system management capability and RBAC and the use of SCL and IEEE ComSet, which is under development, can all provide a means to, to uh, upgrade and patch and change settings as required uh, in response to a recovery need. Configuration change management, well, 61850's system configuration language is a major player in that. The ability to remotely update and patch, which is 90-16, and IEEE ComSet all can provide assistance there. Information protection is about data in transit and data at rest. And uh, IEEE has a standard that is under revision called 1686 that talks about various aspects that need to be implemented in an IED. And there's a whole suite of 62351 and 61850 standards that uh, provide assistance in uh, securing and preventing threats for data in transit and data at rest. There are a couple of SIP standards that 61850 has no impact on, and these are SIP 12, 13, and 14. Besides NERC SIP, there are some priorities about Operation OT priorities that need to be discussed. And these threats are typically prioritized a little bit differently 
than IT threat management. So for OT, tamper detection is one of the highest priorities. Um, and the 61850 paradigm provides message authentication codes to prevent this, to assist in mitigating that threat. Authentication is based upon public key infrastructure and role-based access control. Spoof and replay is provided by a digital signature and the use of unique nonces. And information leakage and confidentiality or privacy requirements are provided through the use of encryption. So the 61850 attack surfaces that people may want to uh, try and penetrate are in two different categories. There's the physical access, and in many situations, the fence is the NERC uh, physical security perimeter. Then you have the cyber, where we've got station bus, and we've got management and a security infrastructure that is typically IP-based. Station bus can support Goose and client server, and process bus is sample values. However, the fact that the management of security within the substation uh, is based upon IP protocols and is routable means NERC SIP does apply even if you are applying uh, security to layer two goose and sample values which have a SIP exception. So what are the technologies in play? There are several standards uh, suites that actually uh, are used by 61850 for security purposes. So if you're looking for 61850 specific security standards, they are typically in the 62351 document uh, framework. What's a key? It's a big number and it's generated with cyber randomness or what's called entropy. 61850 uses two different uh, encryption and message authentication paradigms. One is asymmetric, where there's a public and private key. Only the holder of the private key can decrypt the message that was encrypted with its public key. And therefore, this is what's used in TLS and client server. It doesn't work as well for goose and sample values where you need a group key, which is a symmetric key. So in a symmetric key situation, anybody that holds the symmetric key can encrypt and decrypt the information. And the symmetric key paradigm is used for goose, routable goose, sample values, and routable sample values. Here are the relationships of many of the security standards with the core 61850 standards, which are 8.1, which is where you would find Goose, Routable Goose, and Client Server. Um, and here's the Routable Goose. 9.2, which is layer two sample values. And there are also impacts on ICCP, which are just shown here. You can see that we're using transport layer security, security for MMS. And then for 61850, the key standard for profiles is 62351-6. There is also a uh, key management standard, 62351-9, that talks about how you manage credentials in a PKI and how do you distribute keys for the security management of Goose and sample values. There's a whole role-based access control uh, infrastructure coming from 62351-8 through 90-1 to 
61850-90-19, which is currently under development, which allows access control uh, on logical node information. 62351-11 provides security uh, for XML documents, and therefore it can apply to system configuration language. So what's being done for role-based access control in the client server? It starts with understanding the underlying principles of security that are at ACSE, uh, which provides identity X509 certificates to get, gain access to the application layer. There is an attribute certificate that is used uh, based upon the identity certificate to establish what are the roles for that particular identity. Also, you can see the transport layer security is also in play. Recently, in 2018, there was end-to-end -end security developed that is implemented at the application layer. This is uh, was generated due to privacy concerns from Europe, but it may make it difficult, depending upon which options are utilized there, for edge in inspection. So if you're going to use end-to-end -end security, make sure to uh, evaluate how you're going to do your edge deep packet inspection for that uh, security profile. X509 certificates and public key infrastructure are required to implement client server uh, profiles and security. The role-based access control philosophy is there are subjects that are a user, an IED, or a HMI. There are roles constraints for areas of responsibility. Roles for 61850 have standardized roles of viewer, operator, engineer, installer, a security administrator, security auditor, and role-based access uh, control management. And you can customize roles as well. There are operational constraints. Uh, that can be defined that change your security access depending upon values at uh, any of the data object levels being uh, functional constrained devices or func functionally constrained data attributes. Based upon your objects, you can assign uh, rights to those objects based upon the identity and the attribute certificate and specify what operations are allowed on these objects. For Goose, sample values, routable Goose and routable sample values, there has been a great deal of work to provide resilient security mechanisms. The first principle of securing Goose and sample values is what's called a group, a secure group definition. And basically a group is defined as a service type. Is it using layer two Goose or routable Goose? What is the public publisher's destination address for the data set that's being published? And the data set reference. There are two planes that are involved. One is the security management plane and one is the real-time exchange that actually provides the actual security protection of the operational data. For the real-time plane and exchanges, uh, these are simplified uh, representations of what the frames actually look like you can see that the payloads in both cases are protected by a message authentication code, which is really a signature. So this provides tamper detection and uh, authentication. 
you can encrypt the payloads. It is not suggested that encryption for layer two sample values be performed just due to performance reasons. For the management plane, the management of the symmetric keys has to be very resilient. And synchronization and recovery of keys has to be provided. We could spend about an hour discussing all the technology that's behind this diagram, but basically an, a group member is responsible on power up to do what's called a pool to actually get synchronized with the keys of a particular group. Once it's synchronized based upon utility policy, the key distribution center, the KDC, may be doing pushes to the group members. In other words, the keys and the policies uh, are delivered uh, without the IEDs having to do a pull. If an IED receives a push for a group that it is interested in and it's unable to decrypt that information, it must resynchronize itself by doing a pull. Revocation is determined on a pool. So there are ways to revoke group members. Uh, current, there are two keys that are typically delivered, the current and the next key. And these are all are also delivered with the policies associated with those keys. And typically the keys rotate every 24 hours. All exchanges between the key distribution center and group members are encrypted and signed. Again, X509 and public key infrastructure are used to support the security uh, distribution of keys. There's one other aspect uh, that security for goose and sample values implements. And this is what's called key delivery assurance. So if you have a set of critical group members in a critical group, you may not want to rotate the keys until a certain percentage of the group members have actually received the keys. And this is called key delivery assurance. And it's a policy. Most people would think you always want 100% key delivery assurance, but if you have a IED which is down or has been taken off of the network for maintenance, you're probably never going to be able to count on 100%. So you need to be able to evaluate what percentage for each group is actually uh, appropriate. And therefore, your system design needs to balance resiliency weighted against security and rotation of keys. This only works reliably when keys are being pushed by the key distribution center. So in summary, there are standards available for a wide range of 61850 security. Um, and there are several implementations of various aspects of those standards available from vendors. The deployment of 61850 security can help ease some of the NERC SIP compliance issues. Uh, as I said, implementations vary in what they actually support. And the final thing is the technologies are available Utilities should start specifying and planning to support those functions in order to support NERC SIP and even going beyond NERC SIP. Should you have the power, uh, a PDF of the PowerPoint display, these two slides provide a high level view of the standards that are available or pending that impacts 61850 security. And with that, I will close the presentation.